Once upon a time, with the eyes of the world upon him and an important crossroads in his life as an auteur filmmaker at what felt very much like a major turning point in a tumultuous career, M. Night Shyamalan stepped up with Lady in the Water and delivered unto a nervous and eager viewing public a meandering and almost aggressively anti-satisfying, yet nonetheless bizarre and intensely personal deconstructionist narrative essay in the form of an unwieldy, elevated genre feature that was partly about his favorite themes of working through loss and trauma, partly about the practice of storytelling itself and the reasons for the stories we tell ourselves, but mostly about how everyone who had ever criticized him and his work was a mean, wrong, evil person operating in bad faith and narrow-minded ignorance whose criticisms were an active symptom of everything that was wrong with the world and holding back true visionaries like M. Night Shyamalan from becoming their true self and robbing us of their truth. Really? Now, 13 years and an interesting subsequent filmography later, Shyamalan has returned to that crossroads with Glass, the long-awaited sequel to Unbreakable, which is also a sequel to Split, which of course itself turned out to also be a stealth sequel to Unbreakable. He's rested, tested, been through the fire, seen his peaks and valleys, and thus the resulting film this time is a meandering and almost aggressively anti-satisfying yet nonetheless bizarre and intensely personal deconstructionist narrative essay in the form of an unwieldy elevated genre feature partly about his favorite themes of working through loss and trauma, partly about the practice of storytelling itself and the reasons for the stories we tell ourselves, but mostly about how everyone who has criticized him and his work is a mean, wrong, evil person operating in bad faith and narrow-minded ignorance whose criticisms are an active symptom of everything that is wrong with the world and holding back true visionaries like M. Night Shyamalan from becoming their truth selves and robbing us of their truth. But I mean, at least he didn't cast himself as self-help Jesus in waiting this time, so progress? But yeah, it's certainly early yet, but I have a feeling that it's going to be very difficult for any movie this year to be a more frustrating experience than Glass, partly because it's simply frustrating for all of the regularly banal ways that Shyamalan's films just kind of always have been, regardless of quality, ever since he had that too great, one pretty damn good hat trick right at the beginning. It's too long, it's stilted, it's remarkably pretentious and self-serious, but also leaves you with a mounting sense that the more it wants you to take it all seriously, the less you should. But more specifically, it's frustrating because being frustrating, setting up expectations and leaving them hanging, disappointing the audience, and also the characters being unsatisfying, dashing hope confounding logic seeming to go in more agreeable but also conventional directions only for the purpose of then not going there in order to make a statement about why you're not is the entire point of the film, in which case it's something of a challenge to work out which frustrating aspects are there by design, regardless of success, versus which frustrations are the result of design flaws, which is in itself another layer of frustration. Now granted, it's hard to have a ton of sympathy for the disappointment of anyone who actually remembered the general tone of Unbreakable, yet somehow still expected the follow-up to that moody thought piece deconstruction of the superhero genre set in a thoroughly realistic world without costumes, capes, mutations, but where maybe people who were a little bit stronger, smarter, faster, more intuitive than an ordinary human could possibly exist if someone nudged them to find out, to somehow morph into a conventionally cathartic hero versus villain superhuman showdown between David Dunn and the Horde without Knight pulling all the rugs out from under them. But it's still shockingly audacious just how willing and enthusiastic he is to get busy not delivering on exactly that. Instead, he gives us our first superhuman clash pretty much right away in Act 1 revealing that yes, Bruce Willis' super strong sad sack David Dunn has in fact been operating as a full-blown superhero called the Overseer since we last saw him, and that he set his sights on rescuing four kidnapped girls from James McAvoy's Horde from Split, an extreme DID afflictee whose myriad alternate personalities are enthralled to a higher persona called the Beast, whose emergence triggers an actual physical transformation in their host and grants him superhuman strength based on various animals. But no sooner have the two locked horns and revealed that yes, Shyamalan intends to continue Unbreakable's motif of shooting fight scenes that emphasize how awkward, exhausting, and kind of absurd these actions would look in reality, rather than making them exciting, they're both grabbed up and tossed into a secure, but not like that secure because Blumhouse makes money by not being made of money, mental hospital along with Samuel L. Jackson's Mr. Glass, the brilliant but psychotic comic book devotee who believes superheroes and villains can and should exist in the real world, and was revealed to have carried out acts of mass murder attempting to kickstart necessarily traumatic origin stories to create them back in Unbreakable. The three are all then revealed to be under 
under the care of Sarah Paulson as a psychiatrist specializing in delusions of grandeur, at which point it becomes crushingly clear what the majority of Glass is actually going to be and what this is actually all about, i.e. Knight once again needing to blow off an alarming amount of steam about how unfair everyone has been to suggest that he might not have been the next level visionary he was first pegged as. Paulson's angle sees that she believes thinking you have special powers is a psychological disorder she can cure all three men of, either by talk therapy or a high-tech lobotomy, and there's our ticking clock. And so we have our main storyline and metaphor, an extended series of gloomy arguments about whether or not it's insane, arrogant, or both to entertain the possibility that you or anyone else might be special or unique, and also why it is that mercurial auteur filmmakers can't seem to do a superhero deconstruction without immediately going all Howard Rourke on us. Now, naturally, we've all seen these people do the very things Paulson's character now insists they perhaps just imagined or exaggerated in the earlier movie, so there's never any real doubt how could there be as to what Glass or its writer-director's answer is going to be on the question of should I consider that my assumed strengths are not exactly as I perceived them, but you can at least see where this is a logical place to go, and in terms of exploring the characters further in preparation for a climax where they can collide as more fully understood beings. From a dramatic and structural standpoint, this makes sense. Unfortunately, or not, depending on how much of Glass's batshit off the rails final act you want to assume is intentional or not, Knight has said that his first cut was about three and a half hours long, and honestly, that feels a little short. While the filmmakers seeming disdain for the sound and fury and problems solved with fisticuffs of modern comic book movies remains readily apparent throughout, he also seems to have been sincerely bitten by the cinematic universe bug nonetheless. So while the film's very long, fairly uneventful middle section is indeed mostly about watching David Dunn, The Horde, and Mr. Glass therapy sessions, it's really more of a highlight reel than an in-depth record, because Knight also has a pair of brand new twists, one medium size, one jumbo, designed not only to further retroactively tie the three characters together, but tie the whole wide world of all three films together to a grand unifying big idea story conceit, requiring the film to repeatedly cut away to supporting characters like David's son, Mr. Glass' mother, and Anna Taylor-Joy as the lone survivor from Split, pouring through comic books and Google searches for the clues necessary to set up a bonkers series of reveals within the final moments that either needed to be explained a lot more or a lot less to have worked in any context, but probably neither since it's all caught in a push-pull between Shyamalan's low-key mischievous design to needle audiences hoping he was going to make a fun superhero movie, while also issuing what indeed feels like his manifesto condemning anyone who ever tried to tell him he might have lost that sixth sense Midas touch. In other words, if, as I'm given to suspect was the case, Shyamalan's intent in Glass is to in part deliberately set up and deliver a gigantic letdown for the audience on purpose, in part as commentary on the ubiquity of the superhero genre as constituted presently, but also as the setup for a gigantic out-of-nowhere reveal that ranks as a you've got to be kidding all-timer, even for a filmmaker who's made you've got to be kidding his personal brand for two decades now, I'm kind of at a loss for how to approach it in a critical context. How do you gauge whether or not something fails to deliver if not delivering is what it's setting out to do or seems to be. When is failing at failing not just succeeding? So, okay, Knight, if you were trying to defeat movie critics with the same basic techniques James T. Kirk uses to defeat computerized brains, you may have finally won. Two and a half stars, I think. I have no idea if Glass simply doesn't work or does work and just wasn't a thing you should have done, but it's clear you're going to always at least be worth paying attention to. And that ain't nothing.